Hello, everyone. I believe we are live. I'll wait until you guys let me know that audio and everything is good, and then we will get started. Uh, there's always a delay, so I'm going to sit here and stare at you guys awkwardly while we wait. Um, let's see. Nothing so far. Just let me know when you can hear me. Otherwise, yeah, I think audio's on. Anybody? Audio video check. Thank you, uh, Clark. Fine art. Okay, looks like we are good. So tonight we are painting a rooster in acrylics. I am working on a Frederick's watercolor canvas board. And the reason that I go with that, one, I am, let's back that up. Just for transparency, I'm sponsored by them. That's not the reason that I'm using it. But uh, they did provide me with the canvas that I am using tonight. But the main reason that I'm using that is it is super smooth. So if you have worked in acrylics and you've had a hard time where it just looks bumpy and rough, it might be your canvas. Switch to a smoother canvas. And the Fredericks Watercolor Canvas Board, super, super smooth. It's also not going to warp like the generic ones I've picked up at Hobby Lobby or Michael's hate their generic stuff, except for their paintbrushes. I do like the generic paintbrushes. Anyway, that is what I'm working on tonight. So you'll see as I paint through, go through this, I'm gonna be using a rake brush to create some of the feathers and then the liner brush for fine detail. Super easy to do. It's also super easy to blend because it is so smooth. So whatever canvas you choose, do, if you're working for this style where you want fine detail, you want smooth blending, do choose something that is going to be smooth, whatever that is for you. So, um, yes, please hit the thumbs up button if it, it helps. Actually, I forgot to put the little, um, what is it? The, the survey poll thingy up. Okay. So now the watercolor, um, watercolor canvas, that's actually a good question, Christine. Chris, this is far away. I can't actually see the names because my, these aren't the right glasses for that, but asked it why the watercolor canvas is smooth, whereas all watercolor paper is textured. No, not all watercolor paper is textured. Cold press and rough watercolor paper is textured. Hot press is not. And that's like when I use watercolor paper, I always go with hot press myself. So that's um, just how that goes. Okay. So on to the painting. I have pre-drawn this out on a piece. Oh, we're going to start actually before we get going on to me explaining how I got this on here. We've got from Kirsten a, who his recent, hey, you stay there. He <laughs> was recently joined over on MeWe too. Um, we've got a, a treat for the boys. Are they watching? Gibson knows. You boys want a super chat? And I guess that's a yes. Yeah. So we'll kick the night off with treats. Oh, you get treats already? So spoiled. Okay, if I can get this bag to open. I know. So excited. Oh, that's tasty. Okay, good treat. That was probably too big of a piece. And then they're hacking on my ankle. Go lay down, down. I'll give you a smaller piece next time. First one of the night gets to, gets to have a big treat. Lay down, down. Wade. Apparently we're going to start the evening off with not listening as usual. So nothing's changed there. Okay. Thank you again so much. So back to, yes, we're on this. So you can see, I've got this drawn out on a piece of tracing paper. What I did, and you can just trace directly from your computer monitor if you don't want to freehand, or you can freehand and trace it. Use the same method to keep your work nice and clean. Transfer paper. You just have to slide this on under. And then I use a stylus, which is was sitting over here. Let's pretend this is a stylus. I just have to trace over whatever I have drawn out. And I've got my perfectly clean white lines under there. Now I did, it's kind of funny. I, those of you who are on my email newsletter, you saw this morning, my tip was talking about tracing and how it, it really helps improve your drawing skills. I had someone email me and then unsubscribe, um, mad at me for that. They're so mad because in college, she would never have graduated with a degree in fine art and blah, blah, blah. Here's the fun thing. I just want to throw this out there, not because I think it's funny to make fun of somebody who is confused, but it's something that so many of us here use whatever technique, whatever medium, anything you want, use what you enjoy. Do you like doing photorealism? Don't let somebody, cause they went to college. I always, it's always the people who went to college. Not always, most of the time. It's the people who went to college feel like they need to dictate what everyone else needs to do with their life. It is the weirdest, most bizarre thing. It's like cult of fine art 
college. Um, I don't know, like my teacher said this, my teacher said that, and the amount of misinformation I have heard from colleges regarding art is insane. Just because somebody proclaims themselves, I have a degree in fine art, that does not mean they know what they're talking about. So I just throw that out there because sometimes people are overzealous in telling you how you need to create. You create how you want to create. If you like using a technique I don't like, I don't care. All I care about is that you're creating something awesome that you love. That's all that matters. I mean, don't violate people's copyright. So there's that. But besides that, I don't care if you trace. I don't care if you use an eraser. There are people out there who say, my professor wouldn't let me use an eraser. Your professor's a crackpot. There's a reason he's a professor and not a professional artist. I mean, those are kind of two different things. So there, I'm not saying there aren't good professors out there, but they are few and far between. Good luck finding one. Don't let this idea of, I'm a call, or my, I have a degree in art, therefore I know more than you. No, that is not how art works at all. At all all. Most professional artists that I know who are successful did not go to college for art. So anyway, that is just my quick rant because somebody tried pulling that on me today and I'm like, I don't know if you think that's the flex. If you think that's a flex, it's it's just not the flex you think it is. Um, I mean, that's not how I said that, but it's just sad and limiting how many people are going to be out there and throw at you. Don't trace. It is one of the best ways to learn to draw accurately quickly. It starts correcting things that are off in your work. It starts forcing your brain to see things very accurately and notice detail that you would not have otherwise noticed. I'm not saying to be dependent on, on tracing. For those of us who can freehand on already very accurately, saves us time. But for those who are learning to improve their art, they will learn to draw things accurately much more quickly versus their brain kind of overriding it and going, oh, this, this is drawn weird and it's, um, it's, it's close enough, it's accurate. And they, it gets to where sometimes people, no matter how much they practice drawing, will keep doing the same mistakes over and over again. And it leads to accepting things being very off. Like I've seen where someone did a portrait and I was down here and, and they, it wasn't trying to be stylized. It was just that off. Like their brain just didn't compute that this was off. If they had traced a lot, their brain would have picked up on that. So anyway, just a quick tip about that. Also, we've got Kelsey has a treat for the, okay, say it quietly. You boys want another super chat? Thank you, Kelsey. Oh, we other camera. There we go. There's a smaller one so you won't choke on it. Yes, that's very tasty. Okay, go lay down. Lay down. 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 I need to work with them on getting them to lay down quickly. I don't know why this is a problem every time. Down! I have to raise my voice to get them to remotely go, oh, you, you actually want me to lay down. I don't, like, why? Why do I have to raise my voice? Anyway, um, so there we go. Yeah, Wade is wearing a belly band because Wade is a bad cow who decided after a walk the other night that he was going to mark in the house. Yeah, we're not playing those games. So anyway, moving on. Um, let's go. So that is my, my rant about tracing. If you can't draw, it's going to help you to draw more accurately, but it doesn't do the work for you. It's not like an instant win button. If you already can draw, it just saves time. So there we go. And let's go ahead. If you have any questions as we go, go ahead and leave them out. Although I don't think that Nick is here tonight. I haven't heard from him. Is Nick here? I don't think he is. If Nick's not here, I might have a hard time getting to the questions. He does so much work for that. So if Nick is not here, maybe save your questions for the end because I'm going to have a hard time scrolling to find them all, unless someone else wants to write them all down. And I don't know how to have you get them to me if you do. So moving on to the art. So here is my palette. I am working with Liquitex Basics. Now, n that is not because they're cheap. That's just added bonus. I'm a huge fan of that they are cheap. But... I use them because they're just really good. Um, hold on, we've got a, nope, that is not. I don't know what ha where Nick is. Did he, hold on, let me see really quick. Did I even, yeah, you haven't seen or heard from, I hope he's okay. I don't think I've seen anything on MeWe either. Did I, or did I just not notice? No, I don't have anything from Nick since, yeah, huh. Um, if any of you are bored and want to write down any questions that come in to me or come in and email them to me, let me know. I'll take a volunteer and then just so I don't have a bunch of you doing it because I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions as we go. Like Nick always sends them at the end. Yeah, I'm a little bit worried about Nick now because um, usually he said like I haven't heard or seen anything. No, he's been on Twitter. 
I don't know what, I, I have no idea. But anyway, um, so I think he's okay because he is, you'll put it on Discord, perfect. So Python, if you can just write them all down now, but don't hit enter on Discord until the end, like send them all through at once at the end, that way, um, it's like I can just read down the, the row. That would be perfect. So if you just write them down now and then like or in an hour or whenever I finish this, that's when I'll have you send it all through. Thank you so much. Okay, so onto the actual painting. I am going to start, let's start with the eye. Um, just because tiny detail, I'm going to be using, this as a Simply Simmons round brush. That one is a number eight. You don't have to use the same brushes as I do. You don't have to use the same paint as I do. Just, it's the layering process that I want you to see more than anything. Yeah, and it's easier to copy the questions if you're on PC for sure. Okay, so my, my canvas, I've already painted a dark plum color. It's a mixture of black and a deep violet. And I'm going to start, let's get the eye. So I'm going to pull in some, oh, this isn't lit very well. Let me see if I can adjust that a bit. There we go. I'm gonna use some of my red oxide. I'm mixing water in with my paint as always to thin that out. And I'll add a little bit of black, which gives me this nice chocolate color. Actually, I probably need more red oxide than anything else. Now, red oxide is usually fairly opaque, so I doubt that I'm gonna need to, go, yeah, I won't need to go over this with white first. If you're using a color and it is fairly translucent, like let's say I wanted red. When I get to the red here, I can't just take red paint and paint over that. It's not, it's just, it's too translucent. I'll paint white first or make it light, get all my detail, and then I'll glaze the red once it dries. That's how I will get that. So red oxide is one of my favorites. So we've got that. Let's get, and I'm not gonna worry about the shine in his eye just yet. Let's get the black in the center. And then we've got right around the edge, and you'll see me continuously looking up here. That is where my reference photo is located. And we'll just go right on around that. And that is pretty much it for the eye for until I get the shine. So we'll leave that alone. And what I like to do is just start for one big, tiny, air, like one little area and work my way out. Okay, and let's go with, what do I wanna do next? I'm gonna work on, let's jump ahead to his beak. So I can actually use that same brush, but I'm gonna want another brush to smudge that out. And I'll start with white with a bit of yellow. This is, or actually this is raw sienna. You can see it's fairly dark. Actually, I'm gonna need a little bit more white in that. This is also blinding me, hold on. I think I messed with too many of my lights this week, so everything's a little bit off. I'm just mixing a bit of white in with that and water because that is going to dry way too fast. Thinning that with water. Now you can thin things with a mixing medium. I just don't like the results I get with mixing mediums. It makes the paint feel kind of gunky. I really like what I get better with water. He's got his weird little nostril guy up here. Now I don't worry that my color is exact. I go for my values. Are my darks dark enough? My lights light enough? That is what I'm looking for. Right now, I'm not doing any real shading. I'm just kind of blocking in where that beat goes and then we'll let that dry. Going to rinse that. Now, let's see how I want to do the beat or the, the red up here, I think. There's a few ways I can do that. I think I'm gonna do a light wash of white first. Actually, I can even just use the, the paint with the yellow in it. It doesn't matter since I'm gonna be going over that. And I'm just going to fill in anything that's going to be red. Now this brush is kind of frayed, so I need to switch to something that's in a healthier condition that I haven't damaged. Uh, let's see, do I have anything that's small? See, something like, I don't know, can you see how this is kind of frayed? That is not gonna give me smooth edges. It is frayed, it is damaged. Now, there are certain techniques that brush is perfect for because it's damaged, so don't toss it or anything, but it's not what I'm looking for tonight. Okay, this brush will actually be better. Let me rinse that. Yes, 
Yeah, Lynette, you were right. And I know to do that training that way, I just, it's time. I need to take the time to do it. And we need to do it off, not during a live stream. Okay, but you are absolutely correct on that tip. There we go, this brush is in a much healthier condition. And I need to do a review. I don't have this specific brush listed in the description, but they're super cheap ones that I found on Amazon. So you know how I was talking about earlier, I don't like generic supplies. I love generic paint brushes, like for acrylic painting, I should specify. I don't like generic paint brushes for like watercolor, which is super picky, but for acrylic painting, I absolutely love them. And these are just tack one bristled filberts. The reason, again, that I have to go through and paint this in with a lighter color is because the red is not going to show up as it is. Now, if your brush is too soft when you're working with acrylic, someone on, dis on our Discord, our Patreon Discord recently mentioned that used this word and it was exactly right. It's such a good way to describe it. The paint will feel slippery. So let's say you're using a watercolor brush, a very soft, very floppy brush. You use that with acrylics and it will feel slippery. So if you're having that happen, you're probably using, you need to use a brush that has more firmness to it. You can see like here, I don't know if it show, it doesn't really show up, it's too overexposed right now, but there is yellow on that brush. I don't care. It just needs to be light and opaque enough that the red will show up against it. Like I, I am not concerned about everything being perfect here. Now, another thing I wanna show on this one, I zoomed in pretty far on the rooster and you can see that part of his little, I don't know what it's called, his head flap, what do you guys call that? Um, you guys know more than me. But that skin that goes off, it goes off the page. Don't have it to where it just barely touches the edge. If it's gonna go off, make it go off. But don't have it just barely touching, if that makes sense. You want to either have it within about an inch of the edge of the canvas or just make it go off the canvas. Either is fine. Oh, Nick is here. Yay, he's okay. You had us slightly worried, Nick, because you, you're always the first here. Going back through and filling that in. And really this area around his face is gonna be what takes the most amount of time, if I do my job right. The feathers will go surprisingly fast. They seem like they're the part that'll take the longest, but really they won't. Now I'm just gonna paint around the lines that I had and leave a little shadow so I don't even have to redraw them. I can just see where they were supposed to be around the eye. See these lines right here? I'm just gonna leave that there. And the same thing here. See how I'm painting it so that I can see the different sections. I didn't just paint it solid. I can see the difference from this area Clearly, there's a, a, and there would need a shadow there anyway, so it's not even like I'm making it harder on myself later. It's so much easier that I'm leaving like dark sections so I can see where one area starts and ends. And we need that to dry. And then I'm going to paint the texture, the shadows and the texture, so it's not even time for the red portion of the paint yet either. I almost just slid off my painting stool. Okay. just around that. I completely missed a spot. But see, again, I'm leaving that dark line where the shadow is gonna go, which looks funky right now, but it'll make sense later. Now we dry it. Jason said right now that bird looks like he's sick. Yeah, he looks like a zombie chicken right now, doesn't he? Okay, 
So now we need to start creating texture. We don't want this to just be solid red. That would be very flat. We've got to get shading and we've got to get texture. I'm not even worrying about the red because I'm going to glaze the red knowing the red is very translucent. I'm going to glaze that over. The other bonus is right now when I add in this texture, it can be a bit too rough, too harsh, and that's fine. It's going to all be softened down when we glaze it over. Okay, so this is just a lot of tedious. I'm going to use the round brush again. And we'll go through this very quickly. I'm going to be using red mixed with some black. I say that as I grab them in the reverse order, but it doesn't really matter. I'm going to mix those together. I'm just making a dark color that is not, I don't want it to be straight black. What I really want is a dark red. And this is not the best brush for, let me mix that with a larger brush. That's taking me forever. There we go. So now I've got this darker kind of plum color and I'm also seeing that is not the red I'm going to glaze this with because that red is too opaque. So I need to switch reds when I actually I can probably just mix. Never mind. I'm rambling. I will think it out loud. Okay. So I just need to start creating the little shadows, the little speckles in here that will show under the red. We can see right around the edge here, we've got a deeper shadow, so I'll put that there. Think of sculpting. We're forming the shape now and the texture. Don't worry about the color. And this is really gonna be the key throughout this whole painting. We have a tendency to worry so much about the color. If I just knew the exact shade of red, mine will look realistic. If I knew the exact shade of, um, my friend is messaging me too much there, trying to turn that off. If I knew the exact orange that you used, the exact teal that you used, mine would look realistic too. No, yours would look like a cartoon. You don't need the same colors. What you need to do is pay attention to your values. Are your darks dark enough? Your lights light enough? See how I'm starting to create shape and I'm just dabbing. We've got a little bit more of a shadow right along the edges here, so we'll darken that up. So it's not just this harsh transition between, and this is really a plum. So if anyone is going to bid on this, let me see if I can get it to show up. You can see that's more of like a deep dark plum. It's not straight black. And this is available if you want to own this rooster, you can bid on it over on my website. The link is in the video description. And see how it's not even perfect. Like I'm not, I don't want it to be polka dots. I'm creating texture. I'm not trying to see how they just clump and cluster. But they do have an odd shape. Let's see, we've got a thing that kind of comes around here. It comes back past the eye. So I'm just gonna dot that in. And they move in this sort of row in this area. Now, I don't think if you don't get this little, the weird rows here perfect, I don't think that's really gonna make a big difference in your end result. But that it, I mean, when you're getting really detailed that you, there is like this weird shape in here. So we wanna get that. And then I've got these lighter dots all in here. Now I could make this a little bit darker because when I go over that with a red, it won't be that, oops, that might be a little too dark. Yeah, and I've got a clump of black on there that is where I don't want it. So let me show you how to fix a mistake. So I've got a smudge on there I don't want. I'm just going to take a clean brush with water. And it works like an eraser. I'm just going to lift that up. I could take a paper towel if I want to and wipe that even more. See, I'm really focusing around the edges, these dark ridges. See how I'm cr here creating these shapes. It's not even polka dots everywhere. Look at how I can form shape. Think of sculpting again. And we're just gonna pull more of that down. Now let me change this because this is overexposed a little bit and I want to get that lighting a little bit better for you guys. Oops, but it's not 
the button I need. Hold on one second. Let's switch, um, what do I need? Elgato Camera Tub. That is for this one. And Oops, too much, too much, a little bit better, but still too much. That is kind of accurate. I might have to adjust that as the light continues uh, changing tonight. I was gonna say shaving, the light is not shaving. Yeah, that is much more accurate, like much, much better. And even if yours is solid white right now, because mine was overexposed, it's not going to hurt anything. The cool thing with painting, it is so, especially acrylics, it's so forgiving. If something goes wrong, just layer over it. it, and, it and at this stage, it's not even going to matter anyway. We're going to be glazing red over it. If this was red versus yellow, it is not going to matter. Now what I'm doing right now is creating very quick texture. You could, if you were working larger, you could go even further and also after you glaze the red, add highlights. I mean, you can work so much detail on there, but if you want more detail, I would recommend working larger. It makes it a lot easier to get the tiny, tiny detail. I'm like just reloading a little bit more water as I lift some of that paint back up. I'm going to go through this really quick. Take your time. If, you, if you're following along, you can always rewind this as you need to work. Uh, whatever speed is comfortable for you. There is no rush on this. One of the great things about lessons through video is you can pause and catch up and just work however fits you. Definitely more shading in here. We're going to go ahead and darken some of that up. Okay, let's move on. Oops, that's a little bit too much. My brush is loaded a little too heavily there. There we go. And then we've got this second, second area. And this will have more shading than dots right now. I'm really just focusing a bit more on the dots than anything else. It's quite tedious, but I promise we're going somewhere with this. Now, another option, if you really want to go quickly, is you could just fling and uh, paint, kind of spray it on like I do with stars or flick it on. That would also work. It would, it would be less controlled than this, but I mean, it would give you texture. Little bit of wiggles in here. Well, that's going to have so much more detail later. And then let's get around the eye face really quick. I can go right over now. I can see where those lines were, and that makes it so much easier on me now. I don't have to redraw them in or anything. I can just see where they go. And this scary zombie stage is totally normal. We've got wrinkles, so we start getting more definite lines than dots in some of this. But the big thing, again, we're creating texture. It's almost like a faux finish because we're not taking the time to make everything exact to the photo. We're going for close. Okay, and I'm going to do a lot of shading over the, the red, so I'm going to let that set for a moment. I'm going to work on the beak really quick. 
let's go ahead and add some shading and I can actually use that same kind of plum color. Let's get some right in through here and right up in there we'll soften it and now I'm just going to wipe my brush off. I don't even need to rinse it. I'm just going to pull some white. Just lightly fill that, lighten it up. And see, this it looks so smooth because my canvas is that smooth. Now while I'm at it, I can add a shine over the eye, just a little curve. And now his eye looks rounded. Well, it's a little much, um, but it looks rounded. And we'll do a, a dot there, a definite highlight. So I've got the real bright white and then it just kind of glazes over that area. And that is more of a brown. Let me put another layer of my red oxide. Again, red oxide is a fairly opaque. There we go. I'm gonna pull that down a little bit further. So it's more rounded. There we go, much better. Now we're going to dry this. Oh, I have one spot I kind of missed. I keep saying kind of. I didn't kind of miss it. I did miss it. Let's fill that. Okay, now we're going to dry this and this is when we make his head look really good after all that annoying work. Good timing because that needs to set for a second. D. Lynn Creative Arts said the dogs look too comfortable. Look away. Look how good they're trying to be. We lay here and lick our lips. You want a super chat? Okay. Back up. Good boys. Oh, that was nice and gentle, bad cow. Much better. Okay, go lay down. 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 Gibson, down. Good boy. No, not yet. There you go. Oops, I forgot to switch cameras. You get the point. Okay. Now I'm going to use red. The red that I'm using, it's almost a violety red, which is too much. Thank you so much, Dila and Creative Arts. Okay. Itchy eye. Sorry. Don't mind me. Let me just shove my finger in my eye. Okay. I'm using, this one is another Taquan bristle brush. This is Royal Langnickel. I hate their paint. Love their paint brushes. See, again, I can use any of the crappier paint brushes and I love them. And I'm gonna mix this color here. You can see it has almost a reddish, like purpley tint, which is too much. This, I think is too, oh, that color actually looks better on camera than it does in person. It's almost pink. So what I'm gonna do is take some red and mix that with my red that has that magenta tone, and that is gonna pull it closer to the color that I want while keeping it also very translucent. And this is thinned with a bit of water. I'm gonna dab it on my brush first, there we go. And see as I glaze, you can still see everything that was under it. And if yours is more orange than red or more red than orange, like it, it's not a big deal. Getting the values that we're gonna put in here, that is what's going to matter. And actually mine is a little bit more, um, like it here, even if you wanna change it, I can pull more of that color in. It's not like something to worry too much about having this perfect color. Unless you're trying to color match, let's say you're painting something for your home and it needs to match your decor, that's a little bit different. But other than that, just your values, that is what matters. Light's light enough, dark's dark enough. And I'm gonna just take a mop brush, which is really a blush brush, and soften that out. We're gonna do the same thing here. If it's not transparent enough, go ahead and add more water. You don't wanna add so much water that it's running or dripping, that's not gonna give you the right look either.
There we go. See, he's already looking better. Now, you guys can't see, I don't know if you can see behind me this way. No, you can't see it that way. Gibson's head is off the camera. It's smooshed into the, the tile floor and he's breathing weird because of it. Such weird animals. Okay, let's dry this before we move on to our next layer. And I missed an area around his eye again. Why do I keep missing that same area? Right around here. There we go. Now look how easy we just got all that detail. Can you imagine like trying to just put the right color in the right place would have been very complicated. Although I do need to grab my transparent mixing white so I can put some highlights. Now you can do this with your titanium white for the highlights, but for what I'm doing, I think this will be easier. It's not quite as opaque. Okay. Now I am going to go back to my round brush. Let's add some highlights with that. And so this again is the transparent mixing white. If you're using titanium white, just add a bit more water to yours. Mine is just not gonna show up as much, which is what I'm going for. And let's start pulling in some of these areas. I'm just gonna dot it so we've got that much more texture. Look at how good that starts looking, like so much detail and how easy and fast that really was. And even, again, if you are taking longer on yours, there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean you're not doing a great job. That's a normal part of painting. I paint, ab I paint as fast as I talk. So that I, I've always been very like abnormally fast. So again, if you're not keeping up with me, pause the video and repaint that. There is nothing wrong with that. How fast or slow you paint is no indication at, to how good of an artist you are. And the thing that I'm liking about the transparent mixing white, it shows, but it's not as in your face as titanium white because of titanium white being more opaque. I'm just gonna throw some in here. And look at that, I'm just so excited. It looks so good. Like, I mean, I know that that's what's going to happen, but when you see it come together, it's, it's just so, so rewarding. finger in it where it's a little bit too rewarding. We've got those rows again. We'll just stick some of those back in there. Now here, I am gonna switch a little bit of my titanium white mixed in with my transparent mixing white because I do want that to show a little bit better. We've got these dots around the eye here. I'm just really looking at that photo. I don't care if each line or each ridge is exact, just go for close. But you do wanna look at that reference photo. You don't wanna just glance at it once and think, okay, I know what a rooster looks like. I promise you don't. You could have a rooster in front of you, and if you're not looking at it constantly, you don't know what a rooster really looks like when it comes to rendering it in a painting. You may be able to render a cartoon, but that's about as, as good as that'll be unless you've painted hundreds and hundreds of roosters accurately. You need to pay attention to that reference photo. See what you did there, Jason. And I'm just gonna lightly dot around there. And then we've got this side, it's a little bit bigger for this face flap. And 
maybe it's going to start moving in kind of rows here. Like not totally. This time I'm using kind of appropriately. They're not totally rows. There's kind of rows. The point is it's not totally random polka dots everywhere. Controlled chaos. We can have that come around here. As we get into here, actually those are too bold. Let me dab some of the paint off my brush. There we go. And let's say my white areas were too bright for me, or you did yours too bright. You can just glaze red over it again. You can go back and forth and it's just gonna, the more, more layers you do, the more glazing, the more depth you end up in that piece. It looks amazing. So don't get frustrated if your first few times aren't coming out quite right, just go over it. Acrylics are wonderful for that. If things aren't going right, let it dry or take a hair dryer to it and speed things along and go over it. And I may pull a little bit more like defined red in that. I'm gonna let that dry. And let's see, we've got a yellowy kind of gold, this is more rough. Sienna over here. And I'm gonna pull a little bit of that raw sienna with white, just a little bit around the eye here. Oops, that is a chunk of paint. I need to roll some of that off that brush. Now this looks like too much, but that's because I'm gonna come back around with the black. This brush, really I should switch to a liner brush, but I'm being lazy. When I come back through with the black, that'll thin it out. Okay. Now I'm going to, oh, we need the white in here. Actually has almost a bluish tint to it. I'm gonna still use the um, um, uh, transparent mixing white. Nope, I lied. I need more titanium white. So it's both of those mixed together. And this face flap has bigger chunks in it. Okay, now I'm gonna switch to a liner brush so I have a little bit more control. That is a smaller brush and some black paint. I'm gonna fix his eye here. Oops, a little bit more paint and water needed on that brush. Okay, a little bit cleaning up here. And I need that to dry so I can glaze some more shadows over it and we get to start on feathers. And I may come back and do details, we'll see. But really what we just did, this is the majority. The rest of this will go much, much faster. So I'm just going to take some of that plum color we were using earlier. So that was my violet mixed with black. And I'm gonna add some shading in some of the deepest sections here. And that's glaze, so it's still translucent. It just starts adding a little bit more form. Let's go a little bit darker. So he's got the shadow right under his beak. I need more paint mixed. One second. Thin that with some water. Actually, let's switch to the smaller brush so I have a bit more control here. Why make my life harder than it needs to be? We've got a shadow that comes down this way. And then the thinner one in through here. See how we just start building? It's just this layering process to start to go with what I was talking about earlier where it's more sculpting. We're creating shapes in there. 
highlights and shadows so that he looks more three-dimensional. That looks way darker on video than it does in person. Anywhere we, where we want it a bit darker. And I don't wanna just jump to black for the shadows. While there is some black mixed in with this reddish mixture, it's too much. If I can go with a purple or a plum color in this case, that is much better. And I may still glaze more red when that dries. But in the meantime, let's jump on down to the feathers. Now I'm going to be using a rake brush. And what a rake brush is, is basically a whole bunch of liner brushes put together. So think, here is my filbert brush, which would be my bristles are like this. All rake brushes, bristles are like this. So one brush stroke, I get a bunch of little brush strokes. Oh, new bid for the chicken. Chicken already has a home. Or the rooster, sorry. I know people get weird sometimes with the, that. Okay, and I'm going to be using titanium white. And I'm just going to paint the feathers first with white. We will be glazing color over that. I don't care about the color right now. I care about the texture of the feathers. And that is not gonna have enough water, water mixed in with it. Now, here's the thing with the rake brush. It takes some practice. If you are new to using a rake brush, don't get frustrated. If you don't have a rake brush, just sit there with your liner brush and draw in your little details, no big deal. That is going to be too much paint. There we go. So see how, look at one brush stroke and look at all those little brush, where's the pat, there's the button. Look at those little brush strokes or little lines from one brush stroke. And I'm letting the dark of the background show through. There's my shadows. All I'm gonna have to do is glaze over this. I already have shadows. So you can see how this is going to go much faster than the other portions. I'm just looking at that photo. How long are each of these feathers? I don't, I'm not sitting there counting 14 feathers going this direction, 15 that direction, it doesn't matter. What I'm paying attention to are the general length and width of the feathers and which direction they're moving in. Need more water. I don't know if you can see on the camera, but I'm starting to get this bumpy look. That just lets me know I need more water mixed in with my paint. The brush is too dry. The brush now is too wet. <laughs> just dab that on my paper towel. There we go. Now it's just right. And I don't care how long you've been painting, you are going to have that happen where it's too wet. Now it's too dry. You just go back and forth until you get it to come out the consistency that you want. And see how again, letting the dark show through, let that work for you. And these are these long, long feathers, not a bunch of short feathers here. Reloading my brush, adding more water. If that paint has too much water and too much uh, paint, then it doesn't really work for you either. So you've got to find the right balance. I want them to be fairly wispy. The other thing to notice is these are not straight lines. If you do a bunch of straight lines, you are going to have a very stiff looking rooster. Like it's not going to, it, it's not good. See again, that it's that movement. I don't have the exact same detail as what the reference photo has, but I've captured the movement of the feathers and that is what matters. Now these feathers start to get more thick and short. And then I need to move this up because this bottom section has a bunch of these turquoise feathers just at the bottom here. So I'm just gonna paint those in solid first. Okay, and then back to our wispy feathers.
Remember, don't fill all of that background in. We really want to watch how that, we want those to work into being our shadows. And I'm gonna have more shadows on mine than the reference photo has. I can go a little bit more in, but mine will have more depth because of it. He'll look more fluffed up, which I think is fitting for a rooster. Now I'm really using this right now more like a really healthy, like not damaged um, tack on bristle filbert. So if you've got a filbert, you can be doing that if the bristles are really not frayed. If they're frayed at all, it's not gonna work for you um, quite the same. But right now I'm pushing a little bit harder so it's not really working like a rake brush so much as just a regular tack on bristle because of the way that I'm holding the bristle or holding the brush. I'm gonna be using it to the side there. And look at how what great texture we have now. Like those feathers look amazing, but this is way more shading than what the reference photo has. If I fill in the color and then decide I should go ahead and fill it in deeper, fine. But I'm probably gonna wanna leave that deep of shadows there. It's gonna give him so much more depth. Okay, now that needs to dry. Okay, this should be, eh, I don't know if it's dry enough. Hold on, I'm gonna do it, go over that one more time. If you have any requests for what you would like to see in future live streams, leave comments on that. Um, okay, now I'm mainly gonna be using my raw sienna and my red oxide for a lot of these feathers and then the, the red oxide and the plum as I move up this direction. So I've got a taquan bristled filbert. I'm gonna pull that violet. You, I say plum, it's like any purpley tone and it doesn't really matter. But I'm gonna add a whole lot of plum into that. Get this brownish tone. I'm gonna thin that with some water. Oops, I just got white mixed in with that because the paper towel I dabbed it off on. Let me rinse that. That is not going to come out how I intended. There we go. And now I can just come through here on some of the deeper shadows. And then I'm gonna switch to more just red oxide. And see how just glazing it, I can tint that color. I'm gonna pull that plum down for the shadow a bit more. Okay, now I'm gonna rinse that brush and I'm just gonna use red oxide. If you have burnt sienna, that would work as well. Very, very similar. Now with this one, because it's not as transparent, I'm gonna be a little bit more careful to go on the feathers that I want it to go on. I mean, it's fine if it goes on to the darker background, but I don't wanna make that dark background solid. So see how I'm being a little bit more I'm staying inside the lines a bit more than I did with the plum. Oh, I love this guy. He's coming out so good. I'm gonna get some of this on some of the tips here. And this is just a filbert that I'm holding to the side again. But I am thinning that with water so that it's fairly translucent. Here, actually, I want to get a little bit more of an orangey red oxide. We'll brighten that up. I don't need it quite as bright as the photo because I, I do like having it fade out a little towards the back to stay a little bit darker. Now we have the raw sienna. So it's this yellow gold tone. Oops, that is way too much paint. Actually, I want that with a little bit of actual yellow mixed in with it. That is cadmium yellow he medium hue, I believe. Oops. 
So those are those two yellows together, really, with the raw sienna and cadmium yellow. And you can take some of this and layer it right over some of the red oxide, too. Let that get that beautiful fade. But see how easy the feathers can be if you don't worry. It, can you imagine trying to mix these colors and get the feathers the right shape? I took, I took out the hard part. Like I, I separated two, not that they're in, they're super difficult, but I separated two things and made it like half as hard. So, or half as easy, however you want to look at it, twice as easy by doing it separately. So you just use white and then glaze color where you want it. You can do this with, with fur or feathers. You can do it really for anything but it's so, so much easier. Like why make things harder for yourself if you don't need to? Unless you're the angry lady who emailed me earlier mad about me giving tips about tracing. In case you're wondering, no, I'm not letting that go. It's kind of hilarious, but it just shows what I talk about all the time with colleges. Okay. We've got this deeper reddish tone in here. Now, what if I go too, too, like too much red and I don't have enough of the dark in between? I can come right back in between and I'll do some of that to show you. You can work back and forth. Now we need, oh, I didn't put tea turquoise out on my palette. Let me grab some of that. Again, you can bid on this guy. The link is in the video description if you're in the U.S. I still need to figure out how I can make that happen for people outside of the U.S. I just have not gotten that far yet. I'm going to mix a little bit of yellow in with that turquoise because it's too just light blue. And we've got a few feathers down here. Now, right now, this looks very flat. I'm going to come back through and do a little bit of shading with some plum in a moment here. It's a little bit more bold than what it looks like on camera. That's really dark. I'm going to take a bit of my transparent mixing white. Actually, I'll probably just use some of the titanium white too. Don't want a ton of it, but while that's still wet, let's get some highlights on those teal feathers just so there's some variation. Okay, now I need to dry this and I can come back through and get those plum shadows. And I want to define, I think, a little bit more red. Being that I did so good time-wise, we can put a little bit more red into the face flaps. I want a different red though. I'm not in love with the red that I have on my palette. Let me see if I've got something that will work better. I mean, I know I do, I just, can I find it? This is what I was looking for earlier, cadmium red deep hue. This is the perfect red. And I'm just gonna add some water to that. We'll thin that out. And I wanna really get a little bit more in these feathers, not too much. And then we're going to do a little bit of glazing up here. I want to do a little bit more shading around his face as well with the darker shadows. 
at a few areas that I, I think I can make even better. See, I'm just doing little brush strokes. Like you can see the brush strokes. I'm not trying to fill it in solid here. I'm just hitting a few spots. Okay, now back to my deep plum color. Make sure to anywhere, whether you drew it on with like a white charcoal pencil or if you have the um, the tracing and transfer paper, I've got a few areas where I can definitely still see those lines. I need to go over those and make sure I get rid of those. You can go over with paint or eraser. Either will, well, sometimes the eraser doesn't work. In that case, definitely paint. This is all translucent, so you can still see all of that detail below it. It's actually more red than what you guys are seeing. Let me adjust this really quick. Um, nope, too bright. It doesn't, it is really not liking the reds very much. That's kind of close, but it is overexposed on his face flaps. Eh, it's muddying it up. It's weird how much it's mutter muddying it up. Oh, definitely not automatic. That was a hot mess. Yeah, eh, that's as good as it's going to get for now. I'll show on this camera in just a moment. Just dabbing my finger where I went a little bit overboard, like it's just too thick. Just working on those shadows, creating that more three-dimensional look. have a little bit of pink here on his beak. Just glaze a little bit. Actually, I'll put the color and then I'm going to take a clean brush. Just smudge that out. And let's get a little bit more of the brownish tone in here. Same thing. We will smudge that out. And the last thing, oh, we've got a few more shadowed areas actually. Let's grab some of the black with the plum again. Red and black, it doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna use red because it's right there. All I care about is that it's dark, but not black. And let's see, I would like this to stand out a bit more. So I'm gonna take some straight, like I'm gonna put it on pretty thick. My red oxide, actually let's mix a little bit of transparent mixing white with it. Oh, that's good. Maybe have a few of these stand out a little bit more. Okay. 
And I'm not creating new feathers. I'm really just tinting some of what's already there so it fades from this red oxide color into that yellow. This looks, I have to, I'll show you on this camera. It looks so much better on this, this one. It's more transparent mixing white. Some little guys in there. Actually, let's rinse that brush. I'm gonna make a bluish tone. Well, two things. One, I need to go back to my darker plum. I needed some shadows in here. Whoops, too much water. Too transparent. I need to make some more, some more black. We'll go with red. And let's create a little bit of a shadow on some of these feathers. Taking another brush and smudging that out. This brush has a little bit of water on it. I'm also going over anywhere where I see the transfer paper showing through. And if you're gonna erase areas of the transfer paper showing through, wait till the next day, even if you think it's totally dry. I can't tell you how many times I thought it was totally dry. Was not totally dry and you ended up with a smudge and that was a whole thing. So yeah. See how I mentioned earlier, you can come back through if you went a little bit too much with the lights, you can come back through with the dark. You just work your way back and forth, layer until it looks good. We've got some little white feather tips over here. I don't want to, those to be too in your face, just subtle. Let's get a few highlighted feathers around the neck. Now, I like that this one is a bit darker than the reference photo, especially with that dark of a background. It just works nicer, in my opinion. Um, what was I say? Oh, a few lighter areas. So let's grab some yellow and white and just a few little guys. I'm not pushing very hard. The harder you push with your brush, the thicker your line is going to be. So by using a light hand, you can get these nice thin lines. I'm just hitting the tips of some of these. Again, I don't want to fill it in too much. There we go. Now he needs to be signed. And I, you might think here's the open spot sign there. I think it's gonna just draw your attention too much off the canvas. I'm gonna sign in his feathers over here. I'm gonna use, I'm just gonna mix white in with the reddish black color I had. So it gives me this kind of pinkish tone that works. Just needs to be light enough to show up. I don't like how high that is. Let's wipe that off and do it again. See, like there's nothing you can do that it really messes anything up. You don't like it, wipe it off and do it again. I had a student years ago. She ended up being a singer. She's still singing today. But she was 12, I think, when I started working with her. And she would she had a song she'd sing, take it off and do it over. Why? Because Lisa said so. And she would just sing. She'd make up the lyrics as it went. But it was something that I say so often. When something doesn't go right, just take it off and do it over. Don't, like, don't worry about it. You didn't mess anything up. Nothing's ruined, but take it off and do it over. And like what I just did there. Actually, you know what? I kind of like teal makes more sense than the color I just mixed. Let's go with that. Because I feel like that color ended up being a color, that lavendery color I mixed was a color that is nowhere else in this painting. I'm afraid it would stand out too much. Like you want your signature to show, but you don't want it to be the center of attention either. go. 
go. And that is it. So you can see the signature is clear, like it's visible. It's just not like, hey, look at me. I'm right here. Pay attention to me. It's not a TikToker. Okay. Now on to the questions. Actually, let me pull this over here because I think you're going to see the color a lot better. So, oh yeah, that looks way more accurate. So there is the rooster. If you want to bid on him, he is available. The link is on my, uh, in the video description. He looks so good. I'm so happy with how he came out. Like that is not bad for less than an hour. I am really happy with him. Okay. So questions. Um, there we go. Our first question. Why do I feel like I'm forgetting to do something? I normally run an ad. You know why it is? Because usually I'm switching from one medium, like colored pencils out. Okay, I know why I feel like I'm missing something. So our first question, uh, Christy Lynn said, I know you use colored pencils with your watercolor and, and mixed media, watercolor and alcohol markers in your work. I do not use alcohol markers ever in my work. Um, we'll come back to that. But do you ever combine mediums with acrylic paint? Acrylic, I do. I, use, I do oil over acrylic painting and there's, well, you can't really see it. The one that I'm currently working on is an oil over acrylic. So those would be the only two mixed media I really do with acrylic. But no, I also don't use alcohol markers at all because they're not light fast. Like uh, Copics, not light fast. Horribly expensive, gonna fade like crazy. So whoever buys artwork done with Copics, that's not gonna last you. So yeah, I don't use alcohol markers. But no, um, yeah, oil over acrylic is how I do mixed media there. Um, let's see. Can't, I don't, can't, Cam Lioness? I'm not saying that wrong, right? I'm not saying that wrong. I'm not saying anything right. Uh, said, hi Lisa, I'm a huge fan of your, of your videos. Thank you. Because of your in-depth and insightful videos, I bought myself a tin of 72 Derwent ink tense pencils and a whole bunch of other supplies. Your attitude towards art makes me so happy. Thank you again. Oh, oh yay. You're gonna have so much fun with, I love ink tents. I need to do, I need to work in there more. They just make me so happy when I, like they're such an enjoyable medium to work in. Um, let's see. Dorothy said, if I don't have mixing white, can I just water down titanium? Yes, you can. Uh, Brittany Daniel said, can anyone be taught to see the difference in colors in a reference photo used for different types of art? See the different colors in reference photos used for different types of art. I'm not sure what you mean, but I mean, if somebody is colorblind, they're obviously not gonna be taught the difference in colors there. It, it's never about the difference in colors. It's about the difference in values. Dark, dark, dark's dark enough, light's light enough. I put this up next to the reference photo, my red is not as bright. I don't want it to be as bright because it's got a dark background. I think it looks better toned down like I've got it, but it's not about the colors, it's about the values. So let's say somebody is colorblind. That doesn't mean that they're not gonna create super impressive, super amazing, super realistic work as long as their values are there, because that's what matters, not the colors. I could paint this rooster in green and he just looked like he got into some interesting materials or like he's under green lighting, but he would still look realistic. There's a video, I posted it over, where else did I post it? I think I posted it on MeWe, I posted it on my Facebook page. I posted it all over. Jason Morgan, my friend Jason, just made a video showing the importance of value over color. And he has an orangutan, I think it was an orangutan, is that what it was? I don't remember now, but he painted, uh, he showed what it would look like with blue fur. Still looks realistic. It just looks like he's under blue lighting. It's not the color, it's the value. So could anyone learn to make the color exact? No, because some people are colorblind or some people who aren't even fully colorblind, they just don't recognize color as accurately as some other people. So you're gonna have some variation there, but it doesn't mean that those who don't see color as easily aren't going to do just as good of, just as good of a job as somebody who does. Because again, it's all about the values. Dark's dark enough, light's light enough. Um, Python said, how can I easily identify values in reference photos? Easily identify. Well, it depends. One thing that you can do, let's say you're working in black and white. So if you are really struggling with your values, 
do some pieces in black and white. You will learn so much more about values because you're not able to depend on color in that case to separate one, one area from another, one zone, one subject from another area or zone or subject. You're dependent on just values. So work in graphite, let's say, do you like painting? Black and white acrylic, black and white oil paint. I've done many of both. You can do graphite, you can do charcoal. Focus on that. And then another thing you can do, they actually do make guide little charts that I think are really handy. And I wish I had one sitting over here. And you can make one on your own. But it has a little hole in it and it has different values from light to dark. And you can put that next to your reference photo and then put that, see, okay, that's like a, a value of 10. Put it over to your art. Oh, mine's only a five. I need to go way darker or way lighter. And a tool like that can be very, very helpful. I need to find mine so I can show you guys that. But that, I think working in black and white and using one of those tools can be super helpful. And I think it's just, a, if you look up grayscale chart on Amazon, they sell them for really cheap. You can make your own. It's, they're so inexpensive. They're just handy to have one pre-done. Okay. Dolphin Soul said, I think we need a chicken facing the other direction, like a face off with a rooster. Be cute hanging in a house, not, just not my house. Your house is all dolphins. Um, let's see. And whales and ocean things. Um, Ava said, really love this one. It's just beautiful for a rooster. I'll be doing this tomorrow. Yay. Okay, you do it. Please tag me in it. I want to see, like, I so love seeing your guys' work that you do from these lessons. Uh, can't wait to try and share it on Facebook. Turn, if it turns out half as good, thank you. Yay, I can't wait. I can't wait to see it. I'm excited now. Uh, Shayla said, I love this technique. I've used it a bit. Not recently, though. Yay. Flying to the Moon said, please speak to us of mixed media layering pencil over acrylic and oil paint. Add oil paint. I would not do pencil over acrylic. That It doesn't stick well. It's too slippery. Like, it needs something to grip to. It might work if you worked on, like, a watercolor paper so it still stays rough and you just did it in glazes but it, I don't do anything that way my let's see different mixed media so the mixed media that I use and this is not to say that that's all there is but I have mixed graphite and charcoal I don't like that combination because you can really see the areas where it was the the charcoal is super matte whereas the graphite is shiny like really glossy I don't love those two together I like one or the other um Let's see, graphite and watercolor or graphite and ink tents. Now that looks cool where you do most things in, in the graphite, especially if you do water soluble graphite, and then you can glaze just a little bit of color here and there with either ink tents or your watercolor. That is gorgeous. Or even colored pencil over it in a few areas. Now when I've done, I, I actually, I should do one. I have not done one in forever. When I have done mixed media with graphite and colored pencil, that's a beautiful combination, but I have them separate. I have portions of the piece stay completely black and white just with graphite and portions are completely in color just with the colored pencil. The colored pencil doesn't like to stick to graphite very well. It's too slippery, too slick. Like it, it's, it, well, it doesn't stick. I don't know where I think I'm going with that. But when you keep them in separate zones, oh my gosh, what a stunning, stunning look. That is such a good combination. I am definitely doing one soon. I forgot about that being one of my favorites. I work in so many mediums. Um, colored pencil and I like and watercolor. You would do watercolor first, then colored pencil. Don't then put colored pencil or watercolor back over the colored pencil because you're now putting a water-based product over the colored pencil being wax and oil-based. Those don't work. You can do wax and oil over water-based. So watercolor, anything you want done with water, watercolor needs to be 100% dry, done, done, not dry, well, both, before you go on top with your colored pencil with ink tents same thing you could do ink tents you could put colored pencil over ink tents it doesn't stick that well though I, it's not one of my favorites i definitely prefer colored pencil over watercolor for mixed media um trying to think of what else there are other mixed media that i do i'm sure i just can't think of any off the top of my head so but that'll, that'll get you started on some of these um let's see Kristen said, boy, Lisa, you weren't kidding about the rooster being fluffier than the reference. And yeah, the reason that he's so much fluffier, it's these shadows that I left in. Because I left all of those shadows in there, it makes him feel more floofed, like he's, well, he got angry at something. I mean, he's a rooster. That's like what they do, right? So, and make noise. So yeah, there you go. That's, it's because of the deep shadows within those feathers that creates that fluff. Now, if I filled those in more, if like this one, all of these definite shadows, if those weren't there, he's gonna look more like more calm. He, he's just not gonna have that fluff. 
Now that doesn't mean that every time you paint a bird you want more fluff. I don't mean to say that like, let's say you're painting a chickadee. You don't necessarily want deep shadows within everything because he looks too fluffed. And so it just depends on what you want that bird to look like. Lily said, is it possible to use oil paint on top of colored pencil? Yes, and it should be archival. I'm just not sure why. No, you could if you wanted to put white on top. The thing is though, with oils, you don't, this is where it becomes a problem. If you're gonna do oils, like colored pencil, you're generally gonna be doing on paper. If you wanna do oil painting on paper, you can, but you need to gesso it first. If you gesso the paper, now the colored pencils aren't gonna to wanna to behave nicely. So if you're thinking like, oh, I'll use um, oil paint as my highlights, you're miss there's a step missing between there because you want it's going to soak in weird when you put the oil on the paper it's going to soak in and the oil kind of spreads weird when it comes to paper if you've not gessoed it but if you gesso it then the colored pencils aren't going to necessarily play nice now if i had to choose one i would gesso the paper then do colored pencil and then go over it with oils if i was determined to use that combination that is what i would do to have the least amount of issues later on but that is a very different way to work with colored pencils than just straight on the paper so that gives you a whole, a whole new group of challenges. Clark Bynart said, can you confirm if all Patreon tiers have access to the Discord when they join? They do. And if they don't, I don't know what's going on with Discord. I will have to get you a link. But yes, all tiers get Patreon. Or all tiers on Patreon get, disc, get into our Discord channel. Which, how have you guys been liking it? I see a bunch of you guys here in the chat using our Discord. I have loved being able to chat. We chat about plants, we chat about animals, we chat about Wacom tablets. My gosh, by the way, total side thing, because we've got plenty of time. I was looking into the newer versions of the Wacom tablets. Mine, I bought in 2017, 2016 before they came out with the newer versions. My monitor is not great. Like it's not, I don't want to read text on it. Let's just say that. Like it is a low resolution monitor, but it's big. It's like 27 inches. Its bezel is super thick too. So this thing's a monster. And it was horribly, it's like $2,500. I was looking, I'm like, how much are the new ones? Not that I have any money to spend, I'm broke. But like, if I wanted to save up, how much would I have to save up if I wanted a newer version with a nicer screen? $3,500 and they are very clear that it cannot be used without their stand. They even say on their website, third party stands don't work but their stand is $500. So $3,500, but if you want it to work, you also have to buy this extra $500 piece. Why don't you just say that it's the $4,000? Because that's really what it is at that point. Like, why, I do not understand this whole, you have to have our stand, but you have to buy it separately. That makes no, like I, it makes me question the value. And I already kind of question the value of the company. I have a Wacom tablet right now for digital art. And I mean, I use it, it works fine, but it's very poor resolution for how much I paid for it. And it doesn't, like I opted out of the zoom in and zoom out, zoom out feature because that's a known problem with Wacom. I don't know if they fixed that on the new ones, uh, but it didn't work more often than not anyway. And I knew that from an older one that I, or uh, not an older one, but a smaller one that I had. Same thing, zoom in and zoom out, it wasn't great. But I was just, that price and you don't even come with a stand? Like just, like it's unusable if you don't also buy this $500. Who does that? I don't know. I was just like, okay, Apple, what are you doing here? I don't even think Apple's that shady. Like what in the world? I'm sorry, Apple fans. Um, yeah, I, I was shocked. So I've been looking at alternatives. Is it Huion? I don't know how to say it. I don't know, maybe eventually, and I'm down the road before I decide to upgrade, but I was just looking at that going, I am so glad that there is so much competition because there are a lot of alternatives now. Before, I mean, Wacom was like the original, but I can't get over what they're trying to charge for what they're providing. I'm like, what, are, like, that just limits an artist thinking that, that, that like, oh, Wacom tablet, I want to do digital art. They would look at that and go, oh, I'm out. I can't afford that. There's so many cheaper alternatives, whether it be a tablet, you could do an iPad, you could do, I have my Samsung tab that I love. You can do great digital work on that. You <laughs> hardly anything compared to the Wacom tablet. And then all these other brands are making it. So I'm like, yeah, it just kind of surprised me to see how much Wacom's trying to charge. I don't know how they're getting, like, I don't know why they're thinking Oh, I guess some people are probably paying for it, but yeah, that was surprising to me when I saw. Anyway, moving on. 
Angela said, how do you know that you can get a piece done in an hour? I'm guessing it's experience, but you're so good at being able to finish the piece in an hour. Thank you. And yeah, it's experience. Um, that is, I usually can look at a piece and know how long it'll take me to finish, wh how, whether it be weeks or an hour or two hours or whatever. And that, yeah, a lot of experience. I mean, you have to figure, I've painted probably 10,000 things in my lifetime. More than that. I'm sure it's more than that. Because I don't have all of it. You're thinking, no, there's no way. Oh, yes. Drawings and paintings, I mean, in all mediums. Um, I have so many, like, so much. And I used to teach at one of those uh, sip wine, not, it was called Let's Art Party. So it was like an upper version of the normal paint and sip ones. But I used to teach at those. And so you had that time limit. So you've got, you figure I was creating on top of my own work, maybe let's say I did one or two paintings for myself a week and then add in on top of drawings add in five, six, seven paintings for them. Like you, just the, the experience is how I can usually tell. Although apparently I was wrong that time on the B. I, I, I definitely had a little too much faith in myself on that one. But normally, yeah, I, I can usually look at something and go, okay, that's how long it'll take um, to get that done. Kim said, hi Lisa, love the chicken. Just got my first ink tent set of 12. Is there another medium I can substitute for white ink tents? You could do, um, white gouache, you could do white acrylic paint would be fine. That would be archival. You're both water-based paints. I mean, the, the ink tents isn't going to, the ink tents will not glaze over the white. Like it wouldn't really stick like it would with white ink tents. Like let's say I put white down and I want to make it a light blue. So I put the white first. If I put white acrylic first, the light blue is not really going to stick to the acrylic paint. But let's say you just are trying to get highlights that would work. You could use a white gel pen. You've got a lot of options to play with to try, um, different ways to get the white that way. Um, Brittany said, there is a black drawing stand that comes with the newer iPads, can go in and you can use it as a Wacom tablet alternative. Yeah, exactly. There's so many alternatives now to Wacom. It surprises me that they're, I would have thought they would be more competitive because there's so many alternatives. It looks like they got worse. Like, I don't know what they're smoking, but oh my God, they're, they must be in California. Um, oh, I, that's probably mean. But I'm from Southern California, so I know the things. But yeah, I was really surprised at the lack of competition with them. Like, you, but then again, when it comes to marketing, some people are going to want it just because it costs more. When something costs more, like, it's of, it must be higher quality, it's of higher value, therefore I want that. That's not, obviously not always the case, but maybe that's what they're, they're targeting rich people. I'm not one of those people, so I won't be buying that one. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, Lane said, please share with us whatever you find is an alternative. Yeah, I think that, is it Huion? Hu, something like that. It starts with an H. Um, I, I think I'm going to go with them from what I've looked at, but I, I don't know. Maybe I'll go into like, a store that has stuff in, in person and, and play with them. So, um, Dolphin Soul said, I know you said finish your work. Don't hop to another because you have a bunch of unfinished work, but how do you stay inspired to keep going when it's not going well? The plan something new, have something new I really want to start. So I need to hurry up and finish whatever I'm working on. That's what I do. I'm not saying that's going to work for everybody, but the way that I motivate myself to get something done is the fact that I don't allow myself to start something new. With rare exceptions, I technically did start a graphite piece that I'm excited to do, um, but that's because I needed a different lesson. Like I needed a, something in between what I was working on because timing, it just didn't work out the same, but that's different. If I'm working, let's say I have a, a commission of pet portraits. When I used to do com uh, commissions for pet portraits, you lose the excitement of, I mean, you, you paint so many Italian greyhounds, you know exactly what an Italian greyhound is going to come out looking like. It's not as exciting as, I'm doing a surreal piece and I'm not positive what this is going to, going to come out like. It may, you know, it, there's fun in, in not knowing. So for me, I just wouldn't let myself start something new. I want, I'd have, be excited, maybe do some sketches of what my next painting was going to be to get myself even more excited. Or I design a lot of my stuff in Photoshop, get the designs done. But I am not allowed to pick up a brush, pick up the canvas for that one until this one is done. And that will make me hurry up and finish this and focus on this because I have something new I want to work on. But I think having that goal, that thing that I'm excited to do instead, that always, that's always been the most effective motivation for me. 
Um, Vicki said, hi Lisa, can you give us some help in how you photo your artwork for prints? So I have a full video that is going to be more elaborate. I'll talk about it now. But I also have a video I would recommend you watch that it is how to photograph your, your artwork for prints. I think that's what it's titled. Something like that. But what I do, DSLR, that is going to give you the highest quality image. But that's never going to be super accurate either. I have to take it into Lightroom. So I use Adobe Lightroom and I have to edit it. It may be tinting because the blues came out too navy blue and not enough teal. That happens all the time. Or my darks are like, maybe there's some glare hitting on my darks. I've got to use Lightroom to get rid of the glare. I've got to, which sometimes I just may need to rephoto. But I I have to find a place in my house that I can photograph. And it, it, it's always different depending on where I live. It's never under artificial lighting. I always use natural lighting, which means I need specific lighting outside. If it's too overcast, that may not work. And I find a, a room where there is no to less, I paint a lot of dark things, so that means that I'm going to have a lot of glare. So I use a room for me in the hallway that doesn't have any lights, but there's light, like a tiny window. Well, there's lights, but I mean, I don't turn them on. There's a tiny window off to the side, but it's north facing, so it's like really just diffused lighting. And that works really well for me. But in like my old apartment, I would take it out into the hallway, the like, what do they call it? where there's like all four apartments of this one area, like all our doors face. My neighbors thought I was insane because I'm sitting out there on the floor laying down with a camera trying to take photos of painting. But that worked well or under, it, it was a like kitchen bar type thing. Again, no, it was so that the lights were all very dis diffused. I also sometimes will use actual photography, those diffusers. That will sometimes help so that if light is coming in too harsh, that will, will fix it. I always shoot in raw because that way I can go into Lightroom and let's say I shot to where the exposure was very dark, I can correct that. I can pull up the shadows or darken it. It gives you a lot more freedom on what you can adjust, but I always, always, always need to adjust it in Lightroom. There is never a single case where my photography skills are good enough that I just have it look exactly like that photo. And when I take it into Lightroom, my goal isn't to make the painting look better, it's to make the photograph look as much like the original painting as possible, especially if you're gonna sell it. You want people to know exactly what they're getting. So those are my tips, but I have a video showing you more of what I'm doing that I think would be very helpful. Just do a search here on YouTube. Just say do a search here on YouTube. Make sure you do La Cree, how to photograph artwork. That should pull it up for you. I think if you just do how to photograph artwork, you're just gonna get photography stuff and YouTube search doesn't work. So you have to probably type in La Cree to get the one that I'm talking about, but it's specifically for what you're asking. Okay. Um, Angela said, can you use oil paint and oil pastels together in the same piece? Do they work okay together? So we're going back to the same problem that I have with using oil over colored pencil. Technically, those mediums are compatible. That's not the problem. The problem is with oil pastels, I'm typically going to be working on paint. Now you could work on a canvas with oil pastels. That is certainly possible. And if you do, then yes, you could work those two together. You're gonna to get some interesting results because of the medium. And I don't know if all mediums are gonna play nicely with oil pastels because sometimes you have weird chemical things happen. I don't have enough experience with that to say for certain it would be fine. It should be, but I wouldn't like the paper that I use for oil pastels is not what I would use for oil painting because it would soak in weird. It would need to be gessoed first, which that paper would not be ideal for. So I would probably try it on canvas, but I'm really not sure Unless it's, the only time I can think of that being beneficial is maybe you wanted to brush in some finer detail on top of the oil pastels, that would probably work, but I would personally prefer doing that on a canvas than paper because of the way that oil will soak in and spread on, on the paper if it's not been gessoed already. Or again, if you've got paper that's been gessoed, that would be an alternative. And oil pastels are, they usually play nicely with gessoed paper, with canvas or with gessoed paper, that I think that combination should be fine. Whereas like oil paint on something that you did with colored pencil, not as much because colored pencil doesn't work quite the same. Like you get a completely different look if you work on gessoed paper and definitely on canvas than with the oil pastels, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, next we have, what is the best way to have a digital image printed for framing? So it depends on which way you want to go. It, like G Clay is my favorite is G Clay today. Kind of terrible customer service. Um, the one time I contacted them when something got lost in shipping and their attitude was, well, you should have ordered it earlier. You ordered it over a month ago. That was not, of all the ways to calm down someone who's stressed because something got lost in the mail, like I was hoping you could like contact 
UPS because you're the shipper and like see where what's going on. But telling me you just should order fa um, uh, order sooner or do a rush shipment next time or something like that. I was like, I ordered it a month ago. Why would I need, why would I assume that is not, that was just terrible customer service. They should have been like, we really don't know. We really can't, like UPS isn't helpful in this. There's nothing we can do. That would be way more satisfying to me than you should have ordered sooner. What? Like it was the worst customer service as far as that. But like, I've never had a problem with my orders either. So just to be clear, like everything I've had printed with G-Clay today has been wonderful, but you've got to have a good image. My next tip, do not take, let's say I have this eight by 10 rooster, which you can still bid on by the way. Look at the rooster, look how cute he is. If you want to own him, he'll have a high gloss varnish when I'm done, when, um, before I ship him. But anyway, let's say I wanted to have prints made of him. I am not gonna have prints made bigger than the eight by 10. That is the largest I would go because every time you go bigger, you're separating it, you're stretching it out. So all these gaps, all these little dots that you don't really see when it's small, big, looks horrible. And I've had people argue, no, no, you just need a you know, certain lens and if you take it with a certain JPEG, blah, 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 reasons, no. That is not how it works with art. That's how a camera works if I took a photo of a flower. If I take a photo of a painting, when you blow it up, technically you can do it. The file is big enough. It looks like Wade's waste in my backyard. It looks like what the bad cow does in my yard. It's terrible. Don't, you don't, know. don't blow it up bigger. So whatever print size you go with, the biggest size should be as big as that art is or smaller. Now going smaller always looks wonderful. So if you have, let's say a 16 by 20, I can go up to a 16 by 20 or smaller and it will look wonderful. Just don't go bigger. Um, the bigger you go, the, the less amazing it looks as far as print quality. Now, that said, I've had big banners made for like, like you're doing an art show. I've had big, huge banners made with a painting that was like 30 inches wide and I made it, had it stretched into six feet wide or eight feet, I forget what it was. And it looks wonderful for a banner at a distance, not for a print. So it's a very different thing um, as far as the quality there. So that would be another tip there. Uh, you could also use something like Fine Art America, a print on demand like that. The quality is not gonna be as good as G Clay today. I definitely would recommend G Clay today over Fine Art America. Um, as far as like having, you just wanna have one thing printed, I would go that route. Uh, Fine Art America is great if you are having prints, like you wanna do drop shipments for people, that is a really good way to go, like so you can have prints on your website if it's for multiples. But if you're only doing a one, one print type thing, I would do G Clay today. Okay. Brittany said, I noticed a lot of college university art departments using the Wacom Cintiqs for some of their animation classes, maybe assuming those are industry standard in the animation field. It certainly could be. I mean, it's the same thing as a lot of people think that you can only edit videos using Apple products, which obviously I don't use Apple, so that is certainly not the case. Is Apple good? Yeah. Do I want to pay that much to have their name? No. I also don't like, originally my issue with Apple was just the control factor, like, for example, and I know things have changed, but back, this was kind of what set me off on my, I'm not a huge Apple fan. The first one was that Apple, the iPod, iPods, the old, old ones, whenever, like if I got a new computer, my computer crashed, I could no longer sync the iPad or the iPod because it would lose all that music. There was no way to, to just take the music off the iPad and, or I keep saying iPad, iPod and put it onto the computer. You could, but it was like a hack you had to do. It wasn't like working as intended. They didn't want you to do it because you could steal music. Um, it's like, it's already on here. Why can't I just think? But because I got a new computer, it was a whole, my old computer had crashed. And so that's where this drama was. And yes, I did research and I'm sure it's different now, but that was kind of what set me off on like, you're that controlling of like, I should just be able to move files from location to location. But anyway, it wasn't a thing. And you could pay for different programs, but again, it was a sort of hack. It wasn't like working as intended because Apple didn't want you moving it because whatever. Um, I also like, Actually, I'll show you this. I've always loved changing, um, I don't know if you can see. So my wallpapers on my phones, I have always loved doing, designing like different icons so they look a certain way. And like, I just love, I've got a beta fish on this one, um, the fun live wallpapers and stuff. This is something that I've always really enjoyed doing. And that wasn't something that you used to be able to do with Apple products. So I didn't like the like how controlling they were. I definitely liked the freedom that I got with Android. Now things are changing for certain. They're not what they were 15 years ago. But that's kind of where I went off, where I started looking into a lot of the stuff where everyone's like, you need to get Apple for this, you need to get Apple for that. And it's like, but do I? 
do I? Because I'm kind of liking what I have. And then I I have a feeling it's going to be kind of the same thing with the Cintiq, Cintiqs, the, the Watkins, is that everyone, that's like the name everyone knows. And so I, I suspect we're going to start, I'm glad, we're, I'm just glad we're seeing com, uh, competitors. I'm glad that we're seeing that competition because we've got alternatives that work just as good. Like seriously, my Samsung tablet works, it's, res, it's just as responsive, but the screen is nicer as my Wacom tablet but at a fraction of the cost and it's a full tablet that I use for everything. My note taking, I use that thing for so like, well, I actually use it for notes more than anything lately, but I can draw on it. I can, it has the pen, the pressure sensitive pen. Wacom doesn't own the industry, like there are others out there. So I'm, I'll do some research. I wanna find a much less expensive alternative for sure. And I'll definitely be doing videos letting you guys know what I go with. So yeah, um, let's see. That was a lot of rambling about nothing, but we got the artwork done so fast. So we're just going to chat. Um, let's see. Do I like gal, 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 I know how to, I know what it is. I can't say it. It is a mixing medium for oil painting. No, I don't. I mean, it's fine. It's not my favorite. It's your fast drying medium. I like liquid. I just love liquid. I like how it smells. I like everything about liquid. So I go with that. Um, it's a cheaper alternative to liquid and it's very similar. I recommend it. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. It, it, it works. I just, I like liquid. I just, and maybe it's just me being stubborn because I've used liquid for, uh, God, when did I start using liquid? 1999? Like, it's been a long time. No, it would have been after 2000, like 2001. Because I did have to go through my, I went through a, okay, story time about art supplies. Hardware store items are not painting materials. Not the paint thinner that has a very low flash point, meaning extremely flammable, which also means more toxic. So we don't want to be using that. We also don't, would it work? Yeah, kind of, but it's got some really serious side effects. We also have things like, um, and I learned this lesson the hard way, I thought that linseed oil was the same all around. And so when I first started painting with oils, I started with linseed oil before I found my love of liquid. We're getting married. Um, it, you know, it's been like 25 years, it's about time. But anyway, it, it was, I thought I could just go to the hardware store and save time and get, or money and get liquid or linseed oil. That's not the same stuff. It worked the same, it felt the same, I thought it was the same, and then about six months later, and I'd already sold some of these at our, some of these pieces at an art show, I mean, they were like $50 pieces, so it's not like anyone was out that much money, but about six months later, I started getting these big yellow drips. There were no drips in, in the work. I don't know where these drips, like it was coming through over time. It ruined the art, completely ruined it, but it took six months to ruin. I didn't even know I'm selling stuff that is like, oh, I still feel bad to this day. If you ever bought something from me back in like 2000, 99, right around there, and it, did that? Show, send me a photo. I'll, I'll, I'll make you a new one. Um, but yeah, that was a long time ago and I will not do that again. But anyway, point is hardware store materials, paint brushes, you can use those for different techniques. But as far as like painting supplies, paint thinner, linseed oil, those are not, no, no, stick with your art supplies. Spend the extra money. It's worth it. That rant had nothing to do with your question. Um, Aline said, would digital art piece be an option for a live one day? Yeah, it could. I did, so here's the thing, I'm, I'm too slow. So I say it could, but it probably won't. I do need to make some for Patreon, some more lessons, and it could be for YouTube lessons as well, but it, I'm not fast like this, I'm super fast with acrylics. I am not fast enough because I don't do it often enough, enough with digital art that I feel like I could get something good done. It would have to be like a study of something small. I could certainly do that. Um, so maybe that, maybe we'll do like an eye study or something like that, but, yeah, I just have to do not a huge project. I changed my mind, I could, yes. The answer is yes, no. Um, let's see. I'm just going through. Um, Fran said, I was told to keep my daughter off Discord. That is why I was wondering about it. Discord is a chat service. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want, I don't like the idea of a child having in, access to the internet in general. There are so many predators out there. I don't want them talking to people, strangers on the internet. And I certainly don't want them in Discord or a private chat room with, yeah, I would keep them far away from everything internet. It, it, 
is a good thing that I did not have children because they would hate me. Because I'm like, yeah, no, you're not getting the phone. You're not getting internet. Um, but yeah, it, I would not have a child use most things on the internet because who knows what's going, who's going to be talking to them. So yeah, it's, but it's just a chat thing. For an adult that can be more aware of stuff, it's fine, but yeah. Um... Nick says, apple file here. Yeah, but you live in the North Pole. Your brain is frozen, so you're forgiven. You're, you're just not thinking clearly. I'm a jerk. Um, please, uh, Brittany said, please look up dark board drawing stand for iPad, since this is what I was referring to when I was talking about a drawing pad for some of the newer iPads. Huh. People are talking about nasal drainage. Oh, one thing, and I need to do a full video on this, um, but I do want to warn you guys. So I have been doing, I've been using Facebook, but just to run ads. I don't use Facebook for myself personally because all it is is ads and not, you don't see who you follow. And the only way for anyone to see anything you post is to run an ad. So I'm like, well, I'll use you as an advertiser platform's fine. As a user, you guys, it sucks. I hate Facebook. But anyway, so I've been been doing that and I had to open up my messenger on Facebook, which I normally don't use for that. I can't tell you. And so this is something you guys need to be aware of for Facebook and Instagram. I can't tell you, I have gotten so like nine out of 10 messages I get on Facebook right now are scammers who are leaving messages saying, hello, I would like to know if this product is in stock and how much it can, would cost to ship or something like that. And then a link to a RAR file. Never, never, never. I, even if it's from someone, you know, don't click links. Don't click RAR, fi RAR files. All that is, that allow, it, it's just giving you a virus so that they can hack into your account, basically. That is how these ha how accounts get hacked into. And they're very smart. One of them was actually pretty sneaky because it made me read it twice. Normally, I have fun exercising all of my swear words to the people who, who send those to me, just for my own enjoyment because they're going to, whatever. So um, they, one of them made it look like it was from Meta saying my account has been banned from blah, 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 blah. And it goes on. You need to click this link because you were reported to see what you were reported on. And I read it twice. And of course, I don't, I already know, do not click the links. Yeah, completely fake. And it looked legitimate. Be careful about the scammers and the spammers sending things to your, your profiles. This is how people are getting hacked because it looks legitimate and they click that link, whether it be the RAR file to download. Because it's like, do you have this product? And so if you're selling something, you'd be like, well, what are they looking to buy? No, here's what you want to do. Let's say you're not sure. Well, what if they really wanted to buy something from me? Then you send them, all you say is everything I have can be purchased on my website. Here is the link. If you're selling, you should have a website that is going to prevent any of these scammers. And funny enough, when you do that, they stop responding to you because they're not looking to buy anything from you. But if you're one of those people who is nicer than me and you're like, but what if it was real? It's not real. But what if it was real? Why would they send you a RAR file? But what if it was, okay, fine. Just tell them, here's a link to my website. They, they have no need to contact you. And I've talked about scammers before on social media, but they have no need to contact you to find out if an item is available. You send them to their what your website. All possibilities of you clicking a link are out the window. They don't like that. But, you know, be careful because they, the, I cannot get over how many scammers I'm seeing on Facebook since I started using that for running those ads. Um, yeah, it, it is kind of crazy. Don't click links. And when I say don't, not even if it's someone you know, the problem is if it's somebody you know, they could have been hacked because they clicked a link. They don't realize they're hacked yet and that it'll send a message to everyone they follow or, you know, private message. Do you think it's your friend? It's not. It's the person who hacked your friend and now you've got the virus and now you're hacked and they're going to continue this cycle of just don't click the links. The end. Um, let's see. Do we have any other questions? It's 9.50. We're almost done. What is our... Looks like we are at $93 for the rooster. This guy is still, you've got a few more minutes, 10 more minutes if you want to bid on the rooster. He's so, I'm so happy with how he came out. That is, he's definitely, I say he's one of my favorites, but I say that like every time, so it kind of makes it hard to take me seriously. I'd hang him on my wall, so there's that. Um, do I have any good experience with Twitter? 
yeah, but not for art reasons. The the good experience I have with Twitter is getting it's the only way to get some businesses to to take you serious or listen to you. So let's say PayPal. A few months ago, the weekend, like days before Aquashella, two days before Aquashella, PayPal contacts me, decides they're blocking my account until I give them more information and prove that I've sent things that I just finished so they weren't ready to be sent because they needed to be varnished still. They it, it was a ridiculous thing. And instead of being like, hey, provide us this information by this date or we'll freeze your account. No, no. They froze my account and then requested the information. Now, mind you, I've been with PayPal since, God, 2012, I don't know, for, for so long. I have never had a complaint against me, never had any problems. Why would you suddenly decide you need a copy of my ID, which they have, a copy uh, or proof, the shipping information that everything that people have bought for me the last three, including the one that I just finished five minutes before, like as soon as someone paid, that's when they sent it to me. They um, wanted all this information, froze my account. Okay, I've got Aquashella, I can't have that account. Are you serious? I still need to set up a, an alternative. I have been lazy and haven't gotten to it. But um, they were not going to help me. It said that I emailed them about this. I'm like, I can't provide what you're asking for because it can't be shipped yet. It, it just finished, it. it has to be varnished. It's not ready to go. The person who bought it knew that. So um, I can send you past ones, but anyway, they, when they said it would take 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours for me to hear back. I think it was 48. I don't have time for that. Took it to Twitter, complained on Twitter. Five minutes later, my account is back. Funny that, huh? And that is what I like for Twitter. And that is why I build a following on Twitter. I don't, I don't think it's great for artists. Although I say that yet lately, I've been following more and more artists. I feel like Twitter's algorithm is getting better at showing me what I want to see like things that I don't follow, but it still comes up on my main feed. So I am seeing artists that I didn't even know about. So that part is kind of cool. And you can just mute the ones that are coming up where you're like, oh, you painted that with your feet? I'm not interested in feet paintings. So that is, I, I will say I am seeing more of that. I'm seeing a lot of beautiful photography, like landscape photography that is just like, it. I don't want to say inspiring in that it makes me like, oh, I'm going to go copy that painting. It's just like, oh, it makes me want to paint some more surreal stuff. It That I'm seeing to be really cool. I don't like on Twitter that you can see who you follow. So let's say I wanted to follow a news account. I'm going to be accused of being on one side of the aisle on politics and I don't use my account for, like I don't, I should be able to follow whoever I want without you being able to see what I'm interested in, if that makes sense. I mean, I know I could set up a personal one and blah, blah, whatever, but I don't like that aspect of Twitter still. I don't. But the algorithm is getting better at showing me a lot of photography, a lot of art that I am interested in. So I am liking that aspect, but as far as like getting sales on Twitter, I, I don't think so. Uh, it's, I, I'm sure there's a way to utilize it. I'm not seeing it. The way that I do it, or the, my main use for it is to call out businesses for bad service and suddenly they're giving me service. Suddenly they're paying attention to me when I contacted them through their site, they ignored me. So that is, yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm talking about Twitter currently, which is what, X? I'm not calling it X, it's stupid. At least not now. Um, but yeah, it's that's what I'm using. I'm not saying I'm some Twitter expert. Twitter is just, I don't know. People are extra nasty on Twitter to each other. Like it is impressive. And it's like when they're arguing about stuff, they're doing it in the most ignorant way. Like, oh, you did no research on that subject. And yet you're telling someone off like the nastiest of people, but it's you who don't, like you did no research, none. It, it's not hard to find out the statistics on what you're talking about. Yeah, so there's a lot of that on it. It, it almost feels like the worst of Facebook arguments, but it's like the worst of the worst is what Twitter is. I don't like that ass, like it's, it's so negative. But again, lately, because I've been paying it, like taking time to mute things that I'm not interested, like baseball, I don't care about baseball, muted, don't show me baseball, don't show me things I'm not interested in. And it's getting to where my feed, even though I'm not following people, I follow some of them, but my feed is coming, starting to be curated to stuff I am interested in, even if I'm not following them, like I'm seeing new stuff from cool photographers that I, I'm interested in. So I guess there's that, but um, yeah. So it, it, it's not, like I use it, but it's not my favorite platform, we'll say that. And I don't see it being super useful for artists. I think that 
Instagram is one of our best bet for artists. And MeWe would if we could get people to use it. It is the best. Like, MeWe is so good. I pay for the upgraded things. I want to contribute. I want to support them. You don't have to. You can use it for free just fine. But I love MeWe. The problem is nobody's using it. Like, it's so, not nobody. There are a lot of us. But not like Facebook. But the problem with Facebook is if you post something, no one sees it. At least if I post something on MeWe, everyone who follows me is going to see it. MeWe is my favorite platform by a long shot, but there aren't enough. You, I, We need to get more people using it. But like for now, Instagram, I like better than Facebook for artists, for getting your stuff out there. Making shorts is by far the best way to get yourself seen for the, more often than not. Um, so yeah. Um, Let's see. Gibson, stop it. Um, no one wants to listen to you like yourself. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, in Facebook's algorithm. The one thing I'll say, and this is what's interesting. So I've been running um, Facebook ads on, uh, or for our Patreon, because if, if I were to post, they won't show it to anybody. And like I said, I won't use it. I'm not gonna be one of their customers. I'm not, as far as like, I'm not a user. You can't advertise to me because I don't use your platform except to run those ads. But one of the things I am in, I found interesting is the people who are seeing my ads on Facebook are a lot of the people who are already signed up for Patreon. And that tells me they're showing it to the right people. They're showing it to people who would be interested in what I have to offer. And so it's like, as an advertiser, yeah. I like Facebook. I'm sure every other advertisers do too. As a user, no, I'm not using that platform. And you're not going to be able to advertise to me because I'm not. So yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing. And I'll, I'll let you guys know what the results are more. I think it's going to take a few months of running ads to see how that goes. I've ran ads in the past and it was not successful. So here's the thing about ads. If you're wondering about running ads to maybe sell your paintings, whatever. To do an ad on Facebook, you can't just be like, this painting for sale, photo, done. It's, you're gonna reach more people, but the chances of getting the sale aren't really from that. You have to like craft this whole, like there's a science behind how to craft a Facebook ad. It's really involved. I've been watching some videos on this and learning all about that. And it is surprisingly involved in how to make a successful ad. So like in the past, you, last was it last year? I ran an ad, I felt like $35. So it wasn't enough to really tell that much, but I didn't get good, great results with that but it wasn't a real ad. It was just like, here's a post that I boosted. I wouldn't pay money to boost a normal post. I don't think that's super successful. I think you're much better off to craft an ad like that is meant around what works on Facebook. And like Facebook has the option, well, you can run this ad on Facebook or Instagram. No, because that ad is not crafted for the Instagram platform and it is very different. You're not gonna see the, the right, I would make a different, like if I wanted to advertise on Instagram, I would need to make a different type of ad. It's not the same. So because of the way that I've got the text, the font, all, all, all the stuff. Um, I think it's important to, to craft the ad, to craft whatever post it is for what you're doing. If you're just doing a normal Facebook ad, I'm not, I'm not paying for that. I don't think that's worth it at all. I think that for an ad that is crafted as an ad, which has a goal, it has a call to action, it has like you're telling people what it is you have to offer and why you think that they would benefit from it, that is, that's your ad. You want it to craft it for that specific platform, throwing money at like, in this case, they're like, oh, you can add, run this same ad on Instagram too, because you know, meta. That's not wise. That is not a good idea because again, Different ad for different platform is going to be more beneficial um, and not just paying to boost a post to that. I don't think is, unless the post happens to be crafted like an ad would, but yeah. Um, yeah, that Clark Fine Art says it's ad book. Yep, that is exactly what it is. And I think that eventually, I can't imagine Facebook, I don't know though, people get addicted and they can't rip themselves away from it. But I can't imagine Facebook lasting forever because how many people are gonna be okay with logging on? I went through once. I had six, what was it? God, I posted it on MeWe. Um, I took a screen or I, a video of it and it was like, normally it's every four posts are an ad. But I had one day where I counted 16 ads in a row before I saw anything I personally followed, anyone I knew, anything. 16, or was it 13, 12? Does it matter at that point? It's all ads. I'm using your platform to see advertisements. That is what Facebook is. Now, it, it, normally it's like every fourth is an ad, but still, it's like in anyone you follow, you're not gonna see things that you wanted to see because it's all, mm -hmm. 
Um, and the funny part, I loved this. So Facebook, God, they're such liars. Facebook claimed originally when they started limiting our reach, they said like our business pages, they're like, build a business page, build a following, do all this stuff to build a following, pay to get more followers. And they, they're, they made it sound like you would always be able to reach those people, which obviously they didn't. They started shifting it to where now you have to pay if any of your followers see your stuff to, for them to see it. Like it, I, I would have to, in order to reach 1,000 of my 33,000 followers, I have to pay $10 to reach 1,000. $10 per thousand is pretty much what that works out to be for me. So yeah, but it, um, they claimed that the reason that they were doing that, that they were limiting how many people would see your posts was because people really wanted to see more from their own friends and family. They didn't want them to just be spammed with business posts. But what did they do? They only spammed us with paid business posts, which is worse. Not businesses I chose to follow. No, no. Paid businesses, half of which are scams on, on Facebook. Like their ads, oh my God, it's just, it's so bad. But yeah, great if you're an advertiser, not great if you're a user. Um, they're such liars. Anyway, um, we are at 10.01, so we are done. Congratulations. Who in the, can I see? It doesn't always let me know the newest thing. Oh, it's not going to show me the name. Yeah, I can't see on this who won the, the rooster. But congratulations to whoever wrote one. I'll show you again one more time what you just bid on and won. Yay, rooster. Um, thank you again. I've got to get that varnish. It takes me a couple weeks to get the acrylic sent out. I still have to send out my last two. And are we, is that it? Um, what is for next week? I have no idea yet. Let go have a chat in our Patreon Discord and let me know what you want to see next week. Give me some ideas. Have I ever done stingrays? Yes, but it has been a very long time. Very, very long time. Like it was the early 2000s, I think, the last time I did some. And they were just like in the background of a painting. I don't think I've done anything since. Anyway, thank you guys for joining. Make sure to check out our moderator's channels. Links are in the video de description. Uh, Nick, we've got Joseph. Uh, jo wow, my brain, my brain always shuts down when I go to say Joseph's names. name. The Art of Joseph Fincham. We've got Clark Fine Art. Links are in the video description to their art channels here on YouTube. Thank you again for watching, and I will see you guys next week. Hey, you. Yes, you. I see all your unused art supplies over there. Oh my god, those brushes aren't even opened yet. Tragic. You keep buying new fancy materials, but you don't use them because you don't want to waste them. Stop making your art supplies sad. Sign up for art lessons for as little as $4 a month. There are over 300 painting and drawing lessons available when you sign up and new ones every week. Patreon.com slash Lockery.